Hello, and welcome back to Lesson 14 in our Proclaim Liberty Study of the Constitution. Lesson 14 is our discussion of what actually happened in 1787 in Philadelphia in the writing of the Constitution. Now, as you may remember, 55 men assembled there and uh, what we've given here in the next few pages is a little picture and a summary of some of the 16 more prominent ones. You may notice here as you look at this page, we give uh, the name, the dates of their lives, uh, the state that they were from, and then a little quoted uh, paragraph, a few sentences, and you might say, where is that coming from? Well, one of the delegates, he was a delegate from Georgia at the convention, was named Major William Pierce. Now, Major Pierce <coughs> didn't really uh, say much in the convention himself, but he wrote, and he didn't necessarily write what they said. Madison did the best job of that. But he wrote about the person, why they're so believable, what, what was about their character that made them really, truly great uh, to be at this assembly. So I'm going to quickly go through these 16, just so that we're familiar with them, because throughout the rest of this study uh, course, we're going to be quoting from most of them. And um, these are people, when you ask yourself, who are the Founding Fathers? We refer to that term quite a bit. Who are they? Well, they included the 55 that were at the convention and then some others that we'll mention to you. <clears throat> so, for example, John Dickinson, the first one there, and these are in alphabetical order. John Dickinson was known as the penman of the Revolution because uh, he probably wrought, wrought, wrote more letters, more uh, essays, uh, on the subject of the revolution and the reasons and so forth than any other person. You may remember he was the original author of the Articles of Confederation, wrote the Ar Olive Leaf Petition to King George and so forth. So he's been known as the penman of the revolution. Listen to what Major Pierce said of him. He is a good writer and will ever be considered one of the most important characters in the United States. <clears throat> Benjamin Franklin. Here Benjamin Franklin was 81 years old. <clears throat> it says he was 82, but we think he was 81. Anyway, he was almost twice as old as the average age of all the rest of them. It was really quite a young group that met in Philadelphia, except for Ben Franklin. And this was near the very end of his life. So, um, Major William Pierce writes this of Ben Franklin, well known to be the greatest philosopher of the present age. All the operations of nature he seems to understand. The very heavens obey him, and the clouds yield up the lightning to be imprisoned in his rod. He is a most extraordinary man. Look at Alexander Hamilton. It was said of him, there is no skimming over the surface of a subject. He must sink to the bottom of it to see what foundation it rests on. That was Hamilton. And some of you know that he wrote most of the Federalist Papers. And, and that really comes true. There's no skimming over the surface. He gets down to the very foundation. That was his skill. On the next page, James Madison, known as one of the best informed men of the whole uh, Constitutional Convention. The affairs of the United States, he perhaps has the most correct knowledge of any man in the Union. George Mason from Virginia, a man of remarkable strong powers and possesses a clear and copious understanding. He is able 
and convincing in debate, steady and firm in his principles. Governor Morris. Governor Morris is an interesting character. Here he is a 36-year-old lawyer from Pennsylvania. And, uh, and he had a wooden leg. And uh, it didn't look like a leg. It was just a round shaft, and he kept it polished, very proud of it. It was said that he gave more speeches on the floor of the convention than anyone else. Listen to what his colleagues said about him. One of the geniuses in whom every species of talents combine to render him conspicuous and flourishing in public debate. He winds through all the mazes of rhetoric and throws around him such a glare that he charms, captivates, and leads away the senses of all who hear him. Wow. Then there was Robert Morris. Robert Morris was known as one of the financiers of the revolution, a merchant of great eminence and wealth, possesses an energy of mind that few men can boast of. He says, I am told that when he speaks in the assembly of Pennsylvania, that he bears down all before him. <laughs> then there's William Patterson from New Jersey. William Patterson is the one who presented the, uh, the plan from the small states, you may remember. And it is said of him, and it's kind of interesting to look at his picture while you're reading this, one of those kind of men whose powers break in upon you and create wonder and astonishment. He's a man of great modesty with looks that bespeak talents of no great extent. <laughs> and now we come on the top of the next page to Charles Pinckney. Um, it, he wrote he was only 24, but we find out he was actually 30, but still quite a young man. He is intimately acquainted with every species of polite learning and has a spirit of application and industry beyond most men. He speaks with great neatness and perspicuity and treats every subject as fully without running into prolixity. That means a long and wordy, tedious speech, in case you don't know. That's uh, Charles Pinckney. Then his cousin, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, it was said of him he possesses a very extensive degree of legal knowledge. Look down at Edmund Randolph. Edmund Randolph was the governor of Virginia. And in his delegation were people like George Washington, James Madison, George Mason, all delegates from Virginia in uh, the Constitutional Convention. But being the governor, he came forward with, this po with the postulata or first principles on which the convention acted. Remember, it was James Madison who came up with the 15 resolves which formed the agenda for the uh, convention, but they wanted Governor Randolph to introduce them because he was the, the, the leader of their delegation, which he did. Then there was John Rutledge from South Carolina, a, a gentleman of distinction and fortune, it is said. Then there was Roger Sherman, Roger Sherman is an interesting fellow. It was said of him, in his train of thinking, there is something regular, deep, and comprehensive. He deserves infinite praise. No man has a better heart or a clearer mind. Roger Sherman is the one that introduced, and it took him three times to do it, the great compromise between the small states and the large states, you may remember. On the next page is George Washington. It was said of him, like Gustavus Vasa, he may be said to be the deliverer of his country. Like Peter the Great, he appears as the politician and the statesman. And like Cincinnatus, he returned to his farm perfectly contented with being only a plain citizen. Washington. Now remember, we're reading the account of Major William Pierce from Georgia, who was a member of the convention. He's the one that wrote these things. Then there was James Wilson. What an incredible mind James Wilson had. Listen to this. Ranks among the foremost in legal and political knowledge, 
government seems to have been his peculiar study. All the political institutions of the world he knows in detail and can trace the causes and effects of every revolution from the earliest stages of the Grecian Commonwealth down to the present time. I read about James Wilson and I say, well, if I were writing a constitution without anything to go by, uh, would you want James Wilson on your team? I think so. He was there. And then George Wythe. George Wythe was the first law professor in America, tutored and taught uh, Thomas Jefferson, for example. It is said no man understands the history of government better than Mr. Wythe, nor anyone who understands the fluctuating conditions to which all societies are liable better than he does. I hope you see in this uh, little sampling of 16 of the 55 delegates that were there. These were great and good men. Um, not perfect by any means, but certainly not guilty of the gross things that sometimes we hear about them today. Uh, th these were good people. And if you want a little evidence of that, just review some of these things that some of that was said about them at their own in their own day now following is a list of other people who were not at the convention but uh, who had a lot to do with the adoption of the Constitution most of these people were involved in state ratification debates explaining the Constitution and so forth and uh, we've given them a number between 60 and 70 of those people and we've just given a few here for example that we will quote in our present study so um, you may uh, see some of these names and become quite familiar with them for example look at the first one John Adams he wasn't at the convention no where was he he was our minister to England uh, trying to work out some trade situations over there in England look at Sam Adams father of the American Revolution. He wasn't at the convention. And then we go through some others. Uh, Eldridge Gary from Massachusetts. Uh, drop down a little bit. John Jay, first Chief Justice of the United States, one of the authors of the Federalist Papers. Uh, he was influential. And then look, Thomas Jefferson. You would think he would be at the convention. No, no, he was in France as our minister to France. And uh, so we say at the bottom there of that page, the 55 men who were at the convention, plus uh, between 60 and 70 others, maybe uh, we give them a, a number of 66. If you add those together, you come out with about 120, 121. When we say the founding fathers, that's about how many we're talking about, quite a few. And we'll be quoting some of them as they explain some of the provisions in the Constitution and why they put it in there. And uh, if you go clear back to 1607, you can even come up with more uh, people that we call the founding fathers and founding mothers. So it's kind of nice to have a little idea uh, by name of who we're talking about. On the next page, Roman numeral one, uh, did you know that uh, at this convention, as we have pointed out, and I hope you've seen in this, invited were some of the most outstanding leaders in the country at the time. In letter B, actually there were 73 delegates invited, but only 55 showed up. That's your blank, 55 for letter B. All of the states were invited to come, and all of them came but one, and that was Rhode Island. And so the word went out, and they started calling her Rogue Island, R-O-G-U-E, which is your blank, Rogue Island. And it just so happened that some businessmen were rather uh, embarrassed by the fact that Rhode Island didn't show up, and they wrote some letters uh, apologizing for the behavior of their leaders <laughs> in not showing up for the convention. Because of personal situations, George Washington uh, at first refused to attend and was almost unable to attend. 
Uh, a brother had recently died. His mother and sister were seriously ill. He had contracted rheumatism because of uh, 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 some of the situations during the war. Uh, could not sleep very well at night. And uh, so he really didn't want to come. But uh, he was persuaded and, as you know, eventually did come. Letter E, Benjamin Franklin, as I said, was 81 years old. And he was so ill that he had to be carried in and out of the convention morning and night by four trustees from the local uh, prison in a sedan chair. Under letter F, as we mentioned, there were two of the founders that we've quoted already in this study course that were not at the convention. Number one was John Adams. As we mentioned, he was in England, John Adams, but he had written this uh, document, which is given there, a defense of the constitutions of the government of the United States, widely read by the delegates of the convention. And then number two, Thomas Jefferson, who, as we said, was in France. Now, it's kind of interesting, even though Jefferson was in France, do you remember Jefferson had a favorite saying that went something like this, I cannot live without my books. So when he went to France, he took a lot of his books with him. And when he knew that James Madison was going to be attending the convention, he did something kind of special. If any of you have seen our movie entitled A More Perfect Union, at the very beginning of this movie, which I highly recommend, it's a two-hour movie showing what actually happened at the Constitutional Convention. This, was, this movie was produced for the Bicentennial, 1987, and was given a seal of recommendation by the Bicentennial Commission in Washington, D.C. as one of the best uh, depictions of what actually happened in the convention. Marvelous movie. I never tire watching of this. I've seen it many times to feel the spirit of these people and what happened. But at the beginning of this movie, you had James Madison sitting at his desk. A knock comes at the door. Yes. And the doors open and there's two men with a crate between them. Bring it in, open it up. And Madison stands and reaches into the crate, picks up the little note from the top of its contents, reads the note and says, God bless you, Mr. Jefferson. For what? Jefferson had sent him dozens of books with the recommendation, if you'll read these books before the convention starts, Mr. Madison, you'll be prepared. And so we're finding that Jefferson was actually a tutor for James Madison, who attended the convention. So Jefferson had a lot to do with, uh, with what went on there. Okay, um, over on the next page, letter G, James Madison was eight years younger than Jefferson and as, and, uh, as I said, was uh, one of the most able leaders of the convention. Able is your letter H. And uh, he helped Jefferson do a lot of work in Virginia, trying to get Virginia ready to lead the way for freedom. So he was, under, uh, he was acquainted with a lot of these ideas that Jefferson developed. It was fortunate that Jefferson was present to provide the leadership in the convention. So the convention eventually opens on May the 25th, 1787, as we said, without the state of Rhode Island which is your blank there for Roman numeral two, Rhode Island. Now, it's kind of interesting because a lot of American history textbooks say that the Constitution is a bundle of compromises, or maybe they might say is a conglomerate of compromises, leading you to believe that uh, all they did is sat around and debated and took a vote and came up with uh, the majority opinion of what should be in there. Well, there were definitely some compromises in the document. We'll talk about three of them here. But actually, most of the points were reached not by compromise, but by consensus. 
What's the difference? What, what's consensus? Consensus is general agreement, isn't it? In other words, somebody states a position and somebody may disagree with them, but you talk it out, you reason, and, uh, and, and until you come to an agreement. That's compromise. I'll just give you an example. As you know, the Articles of Confederation had no executive, but they said, you know, we really do need an executive. We need somebody in charge who has the power of an executive. And uh, the next question was, okay, how many executives should we have? And did you know the governor of uh, Virginia, Governor Randolph, proposed that they have three presidents, three executives, one for the northern states, one for the middle states, one for the southern states. And his argument was there's safety in numbers. Three is better than one. Well, you have James Wilson from Pennsylvania who says, uh, in effect, uh, uh, Governor Randolph, you say three is better than one. Haven't you ever heard of the 30 tyrants of Greece? Do you remember that story? Where at one point Greece had an executive made up of 30 members. So if you have a multiple executive, who, uh, what ha who gets the blame when something goes wrong? You see the problem? The other person gets the blame. In other words, you can't fix responsibility in a multiple executive. Anyway, they talked this out, and pretty soon Governor Randolph agreed with Mr. Wilson and said, if, if we can limit the power of the president, I will agree we should have one president. Do you see this is consensus? You talk it out and talk it out until you come to an agreement. Now what's compromise? Compromise is where uh, you give up something you really don't want to, but for the sake of getting along, for the sake of going along and making it happen, rather than just stalemate, you compromise. That's compromise. And there were three major compromises in the document, and here they are. Number one, how soon the national government should begin to regulate or abolish slavery. This was a tough issue. And uh, this movie, A More Perfect Union, deals with it very well, according to the record. And uh, that was a tough issue. Did you know that most of the delegates, most of the 55 delegates, even the ones from the southern states knew that slavery eventually had to go. But they said, the ones from the southern states, if you put a prohibition of slavery into the Constitution, don't expect our states to ratify it. We're talking about Georgia and the two Carolinas. They said, our whole economies are built on this. Uh, you, you need to give us time to work it out. Okay, how much time do you need? And the decision was, give us 20 years. 20 years, we'll have it worked out. So they put right in the Constitution, not until the year 1808, which is 20 years hence, could the federal government prohibit the importation of slaves. And it was understood by that time the states would keep their agreements and do away with slavery, and the issue would be solved. Oh, my goodness. I hope, folks, as we go through this course from here on, you'll see the founders had answers. They really did. They were dealt with some very tough issues, such as slavery. And how do you get rid of it? Well, they had answers. Well, what happened? Well, one of my relatives, Eli Whitney, invented the cotton gin. What did that do? All of a sudden, that... Uh, speeds up the separation of the seed from the fiber in the cotton. And, uh, and so you can have more cotton. You can, you can uh, process it faster. So you need more cotton. And all of a sudden you need more plantations. And you need more people to pick the cotton. And uh, so slavery, uh, I should say it this way, uh, cotton became king and everything associated with cotton became more in demand. Plantations, slaves, etc. And the wishes of the founders was basically put on the back burner. And you know we had to solve that issue in a much less desirable way. At any rate, that's the first compromise. 
which had to be in the Constitution, otherwise there would have been no union of the states. Number two, second compromise, whether votes in Congress should be according to individual states or the population of the states. You remember that as the great compromise between the small and the, and the large states. And then number three, whether the federal government should have authority to regulate interstate commerce. This is most interesting because the founders did not anticipate giving the federal government the power over commerce within the nation. In other words, interstate commerce between states. They really only gave Congress the power uh, over commerce in two main areas. One, to establish a monetary system, which you need a good monetary system for good commerce, and to set the standards of weights and measures, which is what you need for good commerce. Everything else that the, that the government seems to want to get involved in, there was no authority in the founders' ideas. So, but, but the problem was, as I said in a previous lesson, states were setting up these, these boundaries between states and charging tariffs to come into the state to raise money. Well, that's what foreign nations do. And uh, if a state does that, who is to prevent that from happening? Another state? Well, that could lead to civil war. Do you see that? So they said, okay, in order to keep the flow of commerce from being restricted by states, we will give the federal government the power to regulate interstate commerce. And what that meant in those days, regulate means to keep regular, the regular flow of commerce. Isn't that interesting? That was the only reason they gave the federal government the power to regulate interstate commerce. And we'll show you a little later where that got way out of hand, and now there is a whole lot of regulation of commerce. That's not in the Founders' original formula. So we've discussed now the three major compromises in the document. And as we said, it's really a mistake to say that the Constitution is a conglomerate of compromises. In Roman numeral three, we list there the two major plans that were presented. You remember this from school probably, the Virginia plan, the New Jersey plan, and you see the differences. For example, in the legislature, under the Virginia plan, there were two branches proposed. In the New Jersey plan, there was only one. Look at uh, under the executive. In the Virginia plan, one executive. And as we said in the New Jersey plan, it was a multiple executive, more than one. Do you see that there? And uh, there were some others there that you can study. Letter B, it was interesting that Alexander Hamilton, that's your blank, Hamilton, as plans were being presented, he said, I've got a plan, and this plan is one that we already know will work, because these other plans were really quite uh, uh, untried, you might say. And so uh, Hamilton, he wanted to go back to the British pattern and so he proposed, and this is his plan, see if this uh, sounds familiar. Number one, he said, we should have a single executive chosen for life, life. <laughs> Number two, he says, I think the senators should be chosen for life. And number three, members of the House of Representatives should be in office for three years, three years. And number four, the states, uh, I should say the governors of the states, would be appointed by the federal government. Federal government. Doesn't this sound quite British? Yeah. Hamilton loved the British model. And so that was his proposal. I'm sure all of us have been in situations where when somebody uh, was giving a talk that we really didn't agree with, we, we all, when they finished, we all felt like applauding just to be nice. Have you been in those situations? I think we all have. Apparently that's what happened here. Because Madison writes, Hamilton's plan was approved by all and supported by none. <laughs> and uh, that was pretty discouraging to Hamilton. That was, that's when he actually left the convention. He came back at the end, but at this point he left the convention because nobody really uh, supported his plan. Letter C, on June the 19th, a moving speech was given by James Madison. 
This is a speech that has been called the Constitution for the Ages. Everybody was presenting plans. There really wasn't a coming together yet. And Madison was getting concerned. And he says, generations unborn will look back to us for what we've done in protecting them. We cannot fail them. That's a great speech captured very well in this video. And uh, letter D, on June the 19th, I should say after June the 19th, uh, when Madison gave that speech, the convention fell into what is called the crisis period. And that's your blank for letter D, crisis. Um, for example, number one, just trying to decide how to elect the president took over 60, 60, 60 different discussions and ballots because uh, it was very difficult for people to, to come together in consensus or compromise. That's why it was such a crisis situation. Can you imagine 60 different discussions and straw ballots about how to elect the president? See, they had decided they would have a president. They decided there would only be one president. You remember that. Okay, how do you elect the president? This is, this is a tough thing. And there were 60 different discussions, including, for example, uh, one of the proposals was, well, I think we should let the senators elect the president. How do you like that? No, they said that, uh, that, that that's not too appealing. It's too political, too close. Okay, well, how about the House members? No, same reason. Well, how about letting the governors then elect the president? No, it's still political. You see all these discussions? How do you like this suggestion? They says, well, let's let the people elect the president. How do you like that? Do you know they rejected that? They said, you know, the people really won't take the time to study the issues, to study the candidates. And in a big republic, the office of president will be so far away, the people really aren't the best ones to choose their president. How do you like that? And they rejected a direct vote by the people. Most Americans have never heard this. And so they came up with a beautiful system that we call the Electoral College. Now this system has been, uh, what should we say, uh, adulterated and changed and almost uh, done away with. And there are calls for people to do away with Electoral College. And when we get to that part of how to elect the president, in uh, one of our future lessons. I'm going to describe to you a marvelous proposal by the founders in the original document of the, of the Electoral College and why that is still the very best system. I think you might be surprised when we discuss that in a future lesson. Well, it was at this time that George Washington was pretty discouraged and he wrote this is under number one there next to his uh, picture. He wrote, I almost despair of seeing a favorable issue to the proceedings of the convention and do therefore repent having had any agency in the business. What's Washington saying? I wish I weren't here. That's how discouraged he was. And some say that he looked as discouraging uh, as discouraged as and as grim as he did at Valley Forge, and that was pretty bad. Well, it was during this time, number two, top of the next page, when wise old Benjamin Franklin arose and gave his famous plea for prayer, wherein he said in part, the longer I live, sir, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it possible that an empire can rise without his aid? He said, if we have learned anything from the sacred writings, it is that unless the Lord build this building, we shall succeed at this political building no better than the builders of Babel. And he went on a little bit, and then he made a motion. He said, I therefore beg leave to move 
that before we began the business of the day, we invite a clergyman from the city to come in and offer a prayer on our behalf. And uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, some people would say, well, would like to say now when they started praying at, at the convention, everything worked. Well, you can't really say that because uh, Franklin's proposal, his motion, was actually defeated. And you say to yourself, uh, defeated? Don't they believe in prayer? Oh, yes, a number of them did there. And, and probably any one of them there could have given a great prayer. But, uh, see, that wasn't his proposal. This is parliamentary procedure. And the motion was to invite somebody uh, to come in and give a prayer on their behalf. There were, there were two issues with that. Number one, they had already decided nobody comes and goes except delegates. And number two, probably the most uh, important one, uh, it was uh, customary to pay the clergy for their services and guess what there wasn't any of in the till. <laughs> no money. Some of them were actually there on borrowed money themselves. So they said, no, we can't do that. But uh, as we look at the record, it seems that this speech of Franklin had uh, quite a profound effect upon the delegates. So y you assume that they were probably much more reflective or prayerful in their private times and so forth because things did start to happen after a while. For example, in number four, uh, on July the 16th, a major breakthrough came when they decided on representation in Congress. You remember letter A, the small states had been determined to have one vote for each state so that they would get at least uh, their voice heard. The larger states, letter B, said no, it needs to be done by population, by population. Well, of course, that would give an incredible advantage to the larger states if it were by population. And then letter C, as we earlier said, it was Roger Sherman of Connecticut who stood up and proposed that each state have equal representation in the Senate, same number of votes, but in the House of Representatives, it should be apportioned according to population. And it's kind of interesting that Roger Sherman had to propose that three times before they finally took him seriously. And uh, this was known as the Great Compromise. Well, things really started to happen after that compromise was done. And in letter E, by July the 26th, a lot of the principal issues of the convention were resolved and the whole thing was turned over to a committee on detail, which is your blank detail, and this was the committee that put the Constitution in its, uh, in its first rough form. After that, uh, on August 6th, for about four weeks, it was turned back to the whole assembly, and uh, they hammered out many more details. By this time, 11, that's your blank, 11 of the 55 delegates had gone home, and uh, all of New York had gone, but Washington persuaded Hamilton to come back. And so Hamilton did return actually for a final vote, even though he could not vote on the document because the rules required that there be two delegates from a state in the city in order for a state to have a voice in the convention. But Hamilton said, well, can I at least sign the document showing that somebody in New York approves? and they let him do that and that's why in the Constitution on the signature page you only see one signature from the state of New York and that's Alexander Hamilton. Letter G, on September the 8th the whole thing was turned over to another committee called the Committee on Style. Style is your blank. And uh, we're so grateful that uh, on that committee was this man that we've mentioned before 36-year-old lawyer from Pennsylvania named Governor Morris. Governor Morris, and that's your blank, Morris. And that, by the way, is his first name, Governor. Not Governor, Governor. Governor Morris. Uh, we, we, we think that most of the rewrite was done by Governor Morris, 
and it was only done in four days after he got the assignment. We know that he did write the preamble to the Constitution. Well, on the next page, you see then what really came out of the convention, at least graphically. And uh, I love this graphic because it uh, it's on our spectrum, as you see, the three-headed eagle, meaning the three branches of government. And where is it? It's in the balance center, which is your blank in letter A, balance center. Now, I want you to notice some things about this graphic, if you would. Where do the lines stop coming down from the federal government? Do you notice that in this graphic? Where do the lines stop? They stop at the states. This is very uh, instructive and symbolic. In other words, the founders did not intention intend for the lines to come from the federal government down to the individuals and to families and to cities and school districts and so forth. They stopped at the states. It was the states that actually were the great barriers, the great protectors of the people from a perhaps overpowering federal government. Do you see that? This is a great graphic. Letter B, which shows the separation of powers, was both vertical and horizontal. What do we mean by vertical separation? In other words, different powers are assigned to different levels of government. You see those different levels there? You've got the federal at the top, then state, then county, then your township or your city, then family, and then individual, with powers assigned to each one of them depending on their ability to do it. That's vertical separation. We call that federalism. What's horizontal separation? you separate the powers of government horizontally. The founder said, if you give uh, somebody or a group of people the power to make a law, enforce a law, and interpret a law all in one, what do you have? You have a tyrant. So they said, we're going to separate those functions, put checks and balances in between them, and let human nature preserve it. How does human nature preserve checks and balances, or how should it? You have one uh, branch of government becoming jealous. See, that's an element of human nature, isn't it? Jefferson talked about this, becoming jealous and saying, hey, you can't do that. That's my job. You see how jealousy rivals power against power? This is an incredible system that the founders came up with. It's beautiful. Now, Still there in letter B is a paragraph that I want to talk about for a minute. This is a paragraph by James Madison, lifted from the Federalist Papers number 45. And of all the writings, I love this paragraph because to me this has in it uh, pure political constitutional gospel, if I can frame it like that. So I want to go through this with you. Uh, 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 sentence by sentence and see if you don't agree with me. This is Madison. He says, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Okay, if they're few and, and defined, what does that mean you can actually do with them? You can do what? You can list them. You can list them. And so, if you take your Constitution pocket constitution in this case. And if you turn to page 6, in Article 1, Section 8, which are the powers of Congress listed, there they are. Congress has the power to, and then down the page, to, 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 they're all listed there. You see that? And if you count them, there's about 20. 20 powers given to Congress. Not 20,000, <laughs> just 20. All there, Article 1, Section 8. You see that? Then if you turn the page over twice, you come to Article 2. And if you look at the middle of the page, in this case, page 11, Article 2, Section 2, are the powers of the president, the areas of responsibility of the president. And if you actually itemize those, you'll come up with six. 
six areas of responsibility of the president. Not 6,000. Six. You see that? Now if you turn over one more to Article 3, this is the Judiciary and Section 2, and it gives the kinds of cases assigned to the federal courts. It says the judicial power shall extend to all cases, and then it goes through, and, and the kinds of cases are assigned to the federal courts. And if you list those, there would be 11. Not 11,000, just 11. Do you see what we're talking about here, folks? Where Madison says the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government, in other words, the three branches, are few and defined. Will you remember those numbers? 20, 6, and 11. Those are few and defined powers. And as we go through the Constitution, we'll discuss each one of those so you'll be able to understand what they are. Now let's go to the next sentence. Those which are to remain, those powers which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. What does that mean? If they're so numerous and indefinite, what does that mean you can't do? You can't list them. If you try, you'll leave something out, so don't try. Isn't that interesting? Now, of course, we have our state constitutions. I haven't read all of the state constitutions. I've read mine and a few others, but I can guarantee you, number one, the state constitution is a lot longer than the federal. And second of all, you will find no listing of the kinds of cases your state legislature can pass, the kinds of laws, I should say, your state legislature can pass. Did you know that in your state constitution? You won't see that. Why? Because there's, they're numerous and indefinite. You'll leave something out if you tried to list them. You will not find a listing of the specific powers of your state governor nor will you find a listing of the kinds of cases your state courts can adjudicate. Why? Because they are numerous and indefinite. How do you like that? Which really says, where should most government be? At the state and local level, that's true. Do you see that? Numerous and indefinite. Go to the next sentence. The former, meaning the federal, will be exercised principally on external objects such as war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce. What are they saying? Federal government has a few limited responsibilities, mostly external. And I like to think of the federal government as an umbrella over the states. What is, what's the job of an umbrella? To protect, to preserve from outside forces what's under the umbrella leaving the states under the umbrella of the federal government free, now get this concept folks, free to compete for the best level of freedom. Wouldn't that be a great thing to have competition for freedom? What if somebody in your state said, come to our state, come to our state, you'll be freer here than anywhere. We have lower taxes than anywhere, we have a greater protection of, uh, of private property. We have fewer regulations. You want to start a business? Come to our state. You'll have more opportunity to do it here than anywhere. What do you think? See, we, we ought to be competing for freedom. What do we do now? We compete on a whole different level. We have states given uh, tax incentives and other uh, favors to certain companies or certain sports teams to uh, bring them into our state. And how much can we give away of taxpayer money in order to invite certain favorite teams or, or favored businesses uh, into our state? You see this? This isn't right. What about all the other teams and all the other businesses that are here? We're competing on the wrong level. Okay. Now, now go to the last sentence there in that paragraph. The powers reserved to the several states will extend to all the objects which, in the ordinary course of affairs, 
concern the lives, liberties, and prosperity of the state. I ask you, according to Madison there in that statement, what's the highest level of government that should be involved in your life, your liberty, your pocketbook, your schools, you know, your cities, uh, and almost everything? What's the highest level of government, state or local? Isn't that what it says there? Have I convinced you about this paragraph, folks? This is a great paragraph that really explains it all. So I, I recommend that to you. Letter C. The founders provided a horizontal separation of powers, which we've already described, among the three branches. Well, so if you turn the page, you'll see this wonderful graphic again with a three-headed eagle in the balance center. Now, Roman numeral five, as we uh, come to the conclusion here of our study of this chapter, the signing of the Constitution. And in 1787, they said, let's come back Monday and sign the document. Well, Monday was the September the 17th. And so that day has become Citizenship Day, or as we call it, Constitution Day. And 41 out of the original 55 delegates met to sign the document. And that's your blank, 41. And there were three of them that refused to sign the document. And it was kind of interesting, even though there were some that refused to sign it, uh, the proposal was made, well, at least uh, the states can sign it if a majority of their delegation agrees. Is that OK? And so they said, yes. So then we can say all the states unanimously agreed. And so that's what they did. But I want you to look at these three who uh, refused to sign the document, Eldridge Gary, George Mason, and Governor Randolph. And the reason was is because it did not have a Bill of Rights, which is your blank at the top, of, uh, just above the picture there, below number three. And an interesting debate ensued. Somebody says, well, why do we need a Bill of Rights? We've only given the federal government few and defined powers. They don't have the power to trample on your rights. And I thought the reply of George Mason is classic. I'm paraphrasing here a little bit. But he said, but they will. They always do. He said, I would rather chop off my right hand and put it to that document without a Bill of Rights. Was he correct? Uh-huh even with the Bill of Rights, they seem to violate it. So letter D, letter B, as the delegates signed, James Madison carefully watched each one of them. And as Ben Franklin signed, Madison wrote, the old man wept. The old man wept. And you say, what's he crying for? Well, if you read our book, The Real Benjamin Franklin, you will understand that Franklin had tried for 30 years to bring this about, 30 years. And he presented different plans during all that time. And now, just before the end of his life, it happened. And he was crying. That's how uh, emotional he was. So your blank is wept. Top of the next page, letter C. If you've been to Independence Hall in Philadelphia, the chair that Washington sat in is still there. And there's a sun carved on the back of the chair. Uh, it's a sun on the horizon. You see a picture of it there. And Franklin referred to this in the closing remarks of the convention, where Franklin said, I have often in the course of the session looked at that sun behind the president without being able to tell whether it was rising or setting. But now at length I have the happiness to know that it is a rising and not a setting sun. Vintage Franklin, isn't it? And that ended the convention. Well, that ended the convention and it seems like all the delegates were incredibly unified as they signed this document. However, the challenge had only just begun in 
what Congress would do with it and what the states would do with it. And uh, it wasn't long before uh, they found out. Uh, Roman numeral 7, on September 17th, as we said, the Constitution was signed and sent directly to Congress, who was, of course, meeting in New York under the cover letter written by George Washington. And it was, uh, it was fortunate that a few of the Congress delegates were actually at the convention so they could help Congress understand and answer questions about the new document, about the new government. And let her see, after only eight days of hearings, Congress approved the Constitution and sent it out to the states without any changes. And letter D, each state was then invited to call a special convention of delegates selected by the people to ratify the document so that it could truly be a manifesto of the people. Hence we say, we the people. This was not a state document. It was a document of the people. And uh, some of the states that came along a little later refused or at least delayed its ratification because they were concerned it did not have a Bill of Rights. And uh, so the suggestion was, okay, if you'll ratify the document, one of the first things we take up will be a Bill of Rights. And if you submit to us your suggestions, those will be considered. So as it says there in letter E, the states submitted 189 suggestions, if you can believe that. These were all boiled down and submitted to Congress, and Congress passed out 12 to the states for ratification, and the states ratified 10 of them. Hence, our first 10 amendments are known as the Bill of Rights. Well, there's the story of the Constitutional Convention one of the greatest assemblies of people ever brought together for a wonderful purpose. The more I study about the Constitutional Convention, the more I'm convinced that any one of them couldn't have done it. The whole group, I'm convinced, didn't do it alone. I think they had special help. And as you read some of their comments, for example, Washington and Madison both said near the end, it seemed like what happened was literally a miracle. That was actually a word that they used, miracle. So I invite you to continue to study more of what actually happened in this wonderful Constitutional Convention of 1787. Thank you very much.